Hi, everybody, and welcome to my PhD defense. My name is Mark Eater, and I'm a student in Jan Michael Fromm's 3D Vision Lab here at UNC. And today, I'll be defending my dissertation entitled Mitigating Distortion to Enable 360 Degree Computer Vision. Let's begin by laying out the structure of today's talk. First, I'll introduce you to the topic of 360 computer vision. Then, I'll introduce my thesis statement and my contributions in support of it. Next, we'll do a short review of the prior work on the topic and subsequently dive into my contributions on the matter. Then, I will summarize the talk and briefly outline some ongoing and future work. While finally, I will take a few moments to thank some people who have supported me along the way, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Well then, let's get right into it. So, what is 360 computer vision? For the purposes of today's talk, we're going to define 360 computer vision to be performing inference, estimation, and modeling tasks using images that capture a scene with 180 degree by 360 degree field of view. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to simply refer to this as a 360 field of view. To understand how this differs from the typical central perspective cameras that we're used to, it might help to consider how the 360 image is formed. On the left, you can see the standard illustration of a central perspective camera. In a central perspective camera, the image is formed via perspective projection. Rays are cast from a center projection out towards the world, and whatever they hit is projected back onto an image plane. How much of the world these images capture is dictated by the camera's field of view in the x and y direction, and this is a function of the camera's focal length, or the distance from the central center of projection to the image plane. Now the right image illustrates a 360 camera model. Here we replace the concept of an image plane with that of an image sphere. Our center of projection is the center of the sphere, and our rays are cast outwards in all directions with a full 180 by 360 degree field of view. The resulting image is projected onto the inside of the sphere and indexed by spherical coordinates. It may help to think of capturing a 360 image as standing in the middle of a snow globe and just wallpapering the inside of the glass with the image. In any case, uh, because of this camera model, we also refer to 360 images as spherical images. We can capture these spherical images in a few different ways. It's actually impossible to build a, a camera with a perfect uh, single spherical lens due to certain engineering constraints. But there are specialty cameras like the Ricoh Theta or the Insta360 that produce spherical images using spe uh, special mirrors. These are called catadioptric cameras. Other cameras like Facebook's Surround360 or Google, uh, excuse me, Google's Jump VR capture spherical images using a special multi-camera rig with an array of central perspective camera cameras aligned to the same effective center projection. This is known as a polydioptric or multi-lens camera. Now, the final common source of spherical images is by virtually rendering them from 3D models. So using a depth scanning camera like the Matterport Pro 2, we can build a high quality 3D model of a scene. And then we can use graphics tools to render those scenes into a virtual spherical camera. So now that we know how we can create these 360 images, the real question is what can we do with them? Well, one of the most widespread uses is virtual tourism which is actually particularly great for times like now because everybody's stuck at home in quarantine due to a pandemic. Uh, with 360 video, you can be magically whisked away to the African savanna, or uh, perhaps we wanna virtually explore London. Or maybe you're the more adventurous type and you wanna take a helicopter ride over the Victoria Falls in Zambia. Another useful application of 360 vision is for navigation. Google's Street View service was actually one of the first widespread products to leverage 360 images, allowing users to navigate and explore places on the map as though they were there in person. E-commerce is growing as a platform for 360 as well. Zillow's 3D home product, for example, allows prospective home buyers to explore other homes on the market from the comfort of their computer screen. Now, there are many other applications as well. Uh, for example, in medical imaging, uh, imagine ultra-wide field of view endoscopies that can, allow, uh, that can expand how much a physician is able to see. Uh, there's also robotics applications and autonomous vehicle applications. Think of the safety features 
that you can build into your Tesla using the full 360 degree field of view of the camera system. Uh, and then there are also fun applications as well. Think of uh, 360 Instagram filters or auto tagging features on 360 images that are uploaded to social media sites. So with all these exciting opportunities, the real question is, what's holding us back? Well, the simple answer is spherical distortion. Distortion warps images in a location-dependent manner, which results in local content deformation that impedes our current computer vision algorithms. Because many computer vision algorithms have been designed around the concept of an image plane, we need to first project our spherical image onto a planar representation in order to apply the algorithms. Now take a look at the two most popular spherical image representations that we use. On the left, we see the cube map. This is the projection of a sphere onto an inscribing cube. It's quite popular in graphics for providing an efficient solution for environment mapping. Uh, in, in the middle, we see the echorectangular image. This image is formed by projecting the sphere onto a cylinder and then unraveling it. You can kind of think of this as like cutting a line from the north all the way to the south pole on a sphere and then just pulling it open into a rectangle. Now this format is particularly useful for computer vision because it creates a simple rectangular image. However, despite their popularity, these projections distort the spherical content. This distortion is clearly visible when I superimpose Tissot's indicatrices here. These are perfect circles of the same size and orientation on the surface of the sphere, as shown on the right. But when we project these onto the image representations, they deform into ellipses. This change in area, eccentricity, uh, excuse me, eccentricity and rotation of the ellipse tells us how much distortion there is at each location. In an ideal world, we want our planar projection to have perfect, equally sized circles, just as on the surface of the sphere. Unfortunately, this is not the case for these representations, as you can see. In particular, I want to draw your attention to the strong horizontal distortion near the poles at the top and the bottom of the echorectangular image. This results in heavy pixel redundancy, and this is going to come up again later in the talk. But so why is this distortion a problem? Well, for many of these applications we've been talking about, we want to be able to localize and identify objects in a scene. Like we want to be able to understand where Big Ben is or the Tower Bridge or the Tower of London. Or for autonomous vehicles, we hope that the car can determine where the road ends and where a sidewalk begins. So the ability to semantically segment an image is important. Or for virtual tours like Zillow's 3D Home, we want the user experience to feel natural. This means we have to have a good estimate of the underlying 3D geometry of the scene in order to avoid dizzying effects like you can see with the walls or the door here. Now, currently, many of these tasks are achieved using state-of-the-art computer vision algorithms called convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks are, deep, are a deep learning tool that stacks learnable convolutional filtering operations in sequence create a highly effective predictive model. The issue for us is that they're predicated on a local operation, namely convolution. So given this convolutional filter, or it's also known as a kernel that you see on the left, and oh, we convolve on the image on the right by sliding this filter over the image, aggregating local information at each step of the way. This is a has been a revolutionary concept with convolutional neural networks because rather than having a unique parameter for each pixel, as with a fully connected network or multi-layer perceptron, we can share parameters across the image via this filtering operation. Yet this parameter sharing design relies on a concept called translational equivariance. This means that if we were to shift the image in some way, the output of the filtering operation should shift equivalently. But this is not the case with spherical projections. On the left, I projected that picture of the dog onto a hemisphere at the equator and then rendered it to a spherical image. Now on the right, I've shifted that dog up 45 degrees of latitude in the spherical projection. Now notice how this translation operation has changed the image. Here's a zoom on both those images. As we talked about before, you can clearly see the effects of location-dependent warping. Now, even if we were to focus only on a region of the same size, when convolution is run, we see that the filter on the left covers nearly the 
Right, it barely covers half of its nodes. With such distortion, we can't expect this filtering operation to have the same output on the shifted image. This is an important observation. It shows that spherical distortion violates the translational equivariance requirement of convolutional neural networks. Now this impact of distortion is clear from a simple experiment. I trained a small convolutional neural network to classify digits from the then I evaluated its performance at increasing levels of distortion as indicated by this distortion coefficient K1. So here you see an example digit with no distortion with a little bit at K1 equals 0 0.1, 0 0.2, up to 0.5. The result is clear. Even after small amounts of distortion are added to our test images, we find that this can greatly impact the performance of CNNs. This effect has led to a performance gap between networks applied to central perspective images and networks applied to spherical images. Unfortunately, though, it turns out there's nothing we can really do about spherical distortion. This is a consequence of Gauss's famous theorema egregium. And this is that a sphere is not isometric to a plane. So as a result, all spherical images will necessarily have some distortion. Therefore, our only option is to accept the presence of distortion and seek ways to mitigate its effect. As we'll discuss in a minute, there are a few different ways to approach this problem, and many prior researchers have looked to modify the tools of computer vision accordingly. But perhaps we might be more suited for a general solution if we seek out a better representation instead. So this brings me to my thesis statement today. And that is by changing the representation of the spherical image, it is possible to sufficiently mitigate distortion to close the performance gap and facilitate scalable and transferable 360 computer vision. In support of this thesis, I've proposed three contributions. First, to use a subdivided icosahedron for a lower distortion representation of a spherical image. Next, the mapped convolution operation, which enables a fair analysis of different spherical image representations. And finally, the tangent image representation, which is derived from the icosahedron and provides a low distortion representation that enables both scalability and transferability for spherical images. But before we start talking about the specific solutions, let's set the stage for what the general solution should look like. Any solution to the spherical image problem should satisfy three characteristics. It should address distortion, scale efficiently, and permit the easy transfer of existing algorithms to 360 data. Now, distortion mitigation is necessary for the reasons we've already talked about. Content deformation, translational equivariance, and the performance gap. Efficient scalability is key for 360 images as well, and we're going to discuss this concept in detail, uh, or in more detail, later in the talk. Now, finally, computer vision is not an old field compared to uh, like pure mathematics, but we do have nearly half a century of existing work. Any solution for 360 images ought not to reinvent the wheel. They should facilitate the simple transfer of existing algorithms to 360 images. And now, before we dive into my contributions in depth, let's take a look at three categories of prior work that address convolution on spherical images. The first category are, is convolution reparametrization methods. Second are learnable transformations. And the third are location adaptive convolutions. So that first category involves methods that reparametrize a convolution operation in some way. These methods are typically agnostic to the image representation, instead focusing on the spherical nature of the input signal. They're also typically uh, quite mathematically rigorous and approach the problem from a theoretical perspective. These solutions um, often approximate convolution and say in terms of spherical harmonics or uh, spe spectral transforms. Now, if we examine this approach through our three guiding principles, well, we see that they largely address distortion because they're designed around a spherical signal. Although it is a valid question um, to ask whether it's appropriate to ignore the discretization effects of an image representation. Nevertheless, they do largely address distortion. Uh, these solutions have also been quite efficient and thus scale, at least as well as existing methods on uh, central perspective images, but they are not transferable. And this is because they change the convolution operation. We can't take an off the shelf network and apply it using these methods to spherical images. 
Now, the next category of prior work are methods that seek to learn a transform to, uh, to learn to transform a network to adapt to distortion. So these methods aim to learn the distortion function from the data itself. Uh, they're all they all uh, primarily focus on transfer learning approaches, uh, and they they typically are um, implemented by developing submodules or mini networks that can be trained to learn a specific distortion function and plugged into any existing network for efficient inference, inference time adaptation. Now, if we look at our three principles as, as well, uh, by design, these approaches are quite transferable. And they also scale particularly well because they use the same existing tools as central perspective networks. However, they don't sufficiently address distortion. Uh, because distortion can be much wider than the receptive field of a network or than the transform that they learn, they don't fully address the impact of, of distortion on convolutional neural networks. Now, the last category of prior work are location adaptive convolution operations. These methods explicitly incorporate the distortion function by adapting where a convolutional kernel samples in a location dependent way. Uh, these have been designed to be a drop in replacement for 2D convolution, which makes them particularly transferable. But this approach raises the question whether modifying sampling goes far enough to fully address spherical distortion. Now, I'm also gonna put a yellow question mark over the scalability box because I actually already know the answer to this, but we haven't gotten there yet. But it also raises a question if by modifying the convolutional kernel, are we gonna be able to scale as well as the efficient implementations of 2D convolution that we use in our central perspective networks? So now let's move on to my contributions on this topic. But before we get into it, Let's do a quick, quick recap of spherical distortion. First, it's mathematically impossible to remove. Next, it spreads and deforms content in images, which disrupts translational equivariance that is critical to the proper function of convolutional neural networks. There's some remaining questions as well that have not been answered. First, is modifying the image processing tools enough to restore equivariance? So this gets back to those location adaptive convolutions. What about content deformation? Do we need to address that in the representation? And if we're thinking about a representation, are cube maps and equirectangular images the only options? Now, this is an important question because unlike traditional lens distortion, which is a consequence of the physical properties of the camera lens, spherical distortion is a function of our choice of representation. So maybe there's a better data representation than what we're currently using. And this brings me to the fourth question here, which is what do cartographers do? When I first started thinking about this problem, I realized that although it might be a new frontier for computer vision, cartographers have been trying to mitigate spherical distortion for over 2000 years. So surely they must have some useful insight. Well, sure enough, they do. As I discovered, the 20-sided regular icosahedron is considered to be among the least distorted spherical representation. In the cartography literature, it's referred to as part of a class of geodesic grid projections, and it's been used for many applications like weather and climate simulations, among other things. Now, this shape also has the additional benefit that it can be subdivided, meaning each face can be broken into four equally sized smaller faces, which allows us to get increasingly close approximations to the sphere. And if we were to unfold that original 20-face uh, icosahedron and superimpose Tissot's indicatrices, as you see on the screen in front of you, we see that there truly is very little distortion. Each of those ellipses are very near perfect circles and very close uh, to each other in size. But there's still a problem here. Convolution is designed for the pixel grid. The icosahedron is tessellated by triangles. How can we convolve on the icosahedron then? So my solution to this problem is the mapped convolution operation. Recall the 1D discrete convolution operation. It's simply a sampling followed by a weighted sum. Now mapped convolution replaces sampling with a mapping function that dictates where each element of the convolutional kernel samples from an input signal. Now in practice, I implement this by modifying convolution to accept an adjacency list that specifies this mapping. So it makes it a type of graph convolution in a way. 
This operation enables us to map the sampling grid of the traditional convolutional filter to any input signal. In this way, it can be seen as a generalization of those location adaptive methods of the prior work. But why this is important to us is because now it provides a way to make an even comparison between data representations while fixing the network, data set, and tasks. So for example, on an echo rectangular image, we can evaluate different location adaptive kernels, like the standard grid kernel, this is just our standard filter, or the location adaptive filter uh, that has been used in prior work, or the location adaptive kernel that I proposed, which models distortion most accurately for the echo rectangular format. Perhaps most importantly though, the map convolution operation allows us to convolve on the surface of the subdivided icosahedron. This operation allows us to map that convolutional grid in an oriented way onto the icosahedron. So here you see a few examples of, a few random examples of kernel placements mapped to the surface of the inside of the surface of the icosahedron. And that blue sample is always the top left of our grid. With the operation now introduced, um, over the next few slides, we're going to use map convolutions to facilitate an apples to apples comparison between the popular echo rectangular representation and my proposed subdivided icosahedron representation. For our evaluation, we use the same network, the same data sets, and the same two tasks, depth estimation and semantic segmentation. All we're changing is the image representation. So in our first experiment, we look at the task of single view depth estimation. The goal of this task is to predict the distance of each pixel from the camera given only a single image. We evaluate performance for this using two error metrics. The first is absolute relative error, which is the average percent error per pixel. And the second is the end liar percentage, which is the percentage of, excuse me, the percentage of uh, predictions that fall within 25% of the ground truth. The results of this experiment are unequivocally clear. The subdivided icosahedron representation significantly outperforms any location adaptive kernel on an echo rectangular image. In fact, it improves performance by nearly 14%. Mind you, all we've done here is change the image representation. Everything else has been held constant. So these results tell us two things. First, they demonstrate that simply changing where the kernel samples is not enough we need to address distortion in the representation as well. The second thing it tells us is that it confirms that mitigating distortion will help us close the performance gap. We additionally evaluate the icosahedral representation through the task of semantic segmentation. Now here, the goal is to predict a semantic label like ceiling or floor or chair for every pixel in the image. For this experiment, we use the mean intersection over union or mean IOU metric to evaluate performance. This measure encapsulates both the accuracy of our predictions and the resulting segmentation's precision. Once again, we see the icosahedron outperforms the echo rectangular format. However, in this case, it's actually interesting to look at the few examples where the echo rectangular format actually performs better, like the ceiling and the rug pixels. So note that the data set we use consists of images of indoor scenes. So these ceiling and rug pixels are typically found at the top and the bottom of the echo rectangular image. Now recall what we observed earlier. This is where distortion is highest in that format. The pixel redundancy that results ends up biasing our model due to oversampling of those classes during training. This is why we also see the floor class do quite well. Nevertheless, the icosahedron still performs much better overall, improving results by over 12.5%. So now we've compared echo rectangular images to the icosahedron, but if you recall, there's another common spherical representation, the cube map. And although it's highly used in graphics, evolutional neural networks. The issue is that there's no orientation consistency on the positive and negative y uh, faces. Uh, excuse me, faces, um, information radiates outwards from the poles. And you can see this effect especially clearly if we look at Earth as a cube map. Look at the grid lines around the North and South Pole. They're essentially, uh, this lack of consistent orientation is problematic for convolutional filters because uh, they're not robust to such extreme rotations. 
Now, alternatively, if we were to take advantage of a pixel tessellation of the faces, filter ambiguities are going to arise at the corner of the cube. Part of the filter gets lost in the folds, as you can see in the image here. Where do those top right four samples go? Now, a final option would be to simply map convolution to the cube, treating it as a 3D shape. But if we're going to do that, then, well, we might as well just use the icosahedron because it has better distortion properties. So let's pause here for a second and look at some high-level takeaways from these experiments. First, changing the image processing tools does not go far enough to address distortion. We need to also consider changing the representation. Next, cube maps, while having a lower distortion characteristic than equirectangular images, create new issues for convolution. So they're not a useful representation for our purposes either. However, the icosahedron works. And in fact, it works quite well. In fact, the icosahedron has been gaining popularity among concurrent work on this topic. Papers touting its benefits were published at four of the major vision and machine learning conferences this past year. All of these works have been based on a useful analogy between subdivision and image up and down sampling. Now, on the bottom of the screen, you can see a pixel grid, and above it, a regular icosahedron. Now, when we upsample an image, each pixel becomes four. When we subdivide the icosahedron, each face becomes four faces. So on the left, you see the equations for the number of faces and vertices for an icosahedron subdivided k times. Now, the thing to note here is this factor of four. To associate icosahedral representations with an equivalent equirectangular representation. So a level zero icosahedron with no subdivisions would be a two by four pixel equirectangular image. Level one would be four by eight pixel equirectangular image. And you know, if we skip ahead, level five would be a 64 by 128, and so on and so forth. Now notice that the levels five, seven, and eight. But pay attention to these numbers that I've just highlighted in green. These denote the angular resolution of the image. So this is the number of degrees of our field of view that gets discretized into a single pixel. Compare these to standard VGA resolution perspective images, which has an angular resolution of 0.094 degrees per pixel. This is significantly lower than the highest spherical image re uh, resolution processed by the concurrent work. And this gets back to that issue of scalability I brought up earlier in the talk. Discretizing the world into pixels is inherently a lossy operation. For a spherical image to capture the world with the same level of detail and granularity as a central perspective image, it must have a higher pixel resolution due to its wider field of view. Otherwise, we're going to miss out on important information. So now this VGA resolution image is most comparable to a level 10 icosahedron, or a 4K equirectangular image. The problem is, is that these existing methods are generally unable to scale efficiently to that resolution. So the logical question is, why don't they scale? Well, the simple answer is because they all modify the convolution operation. So because they're built around the icosahedron, each of these methods sufficiently address the spherical distortion problem. However, most don't scale. The lone approach that does scale efficiently, the UGSCNN method, is actually a type of reparameterization method, which, if you recall, does not transfer. So two of the other methods do propose ways to transfer traditional networks, but they're still held back by their ability, to, um, their inability to scale as efficiently as networks for pers uh, central perspective images. And so one of the re big reasons for this is that by changing the convolution operation, they cannot take advantage of efficient convolution implementations and their associated hardware optimizations. Unfortunately, although it's a useful tool for evaluating spherical image representations, the map convolution scales poorly too. Now, the reason for this is because the use of mapping functions breaks the data locality constraints that supercharge convolution implementations on the GPU. In our case, this results in a 20x slowdown for mesh sampling, which is what we use to sample from the subdivided icosahedron. Now, one of the big reasons for this is that seemingly useful analogy that ties subdivision level to spherical image resolution. In just a second, we're going to look into this matter a little further. But first, let's take stock of the map convolution approach. So it does address the distortion issue because it enables convolution on the subdivided icosahedron. 
and it does enable transferability because it can be a drop in replacement for any existing convolutional layer. However, it's not scalable due to data locality problems, and thus it's not a complete solution to our problem. So one interesting, excuse me, one interesting thing to observe is that when using the subdivided icosahedron, distortion is more or less mitigated by the third subdivision. So this plot on the right shows the ratio of the surface area of the uh, subdivided icosahedron to that of a sphere. And as the ratio approaches one, we approach a perfect approximation to a sphere. So very little distortion. Now that red line at subdivision level three indicates where we really start to see diminishing returns in terms of distortion reduction. However, due to our analogy between image resolution and subdivision level, current methods are forced to continue subdividing in order to model higher resolution images. So as I mentioned, this is a source of the scalability problem. It's also worth noting that the best performing concurrent work from Zhang et al uses the unfolded representation of the icosahedron, or the net. And this has a distortion characteristic equivalent to a simple 20-face regular icosahedron without any subdivision, so level zero. So it seems that for certain tasks, at least, distortion can be sufficiently mitigated without the need for excessive subdivi excuse me, subdivisions. So these observations raise some new questions. First, can we find a way to leverage both the icosahedron and the standard 2D convolution. Using the standard 2D convolution will give both scalability and transferability, while the icosahedron will reduce distortion. Next, can we find a solution that allows us to modulate our distortion depending on the application? As we just saw, certain applications might be capable of handling higher levels of resolution, uh, excuse me, higher levels of distortion than others. Now, finally, if we want to provide this tunability, we need to untether the input spherical resolution from the underlying subdivision level. As an answer to these questions, I propose a tangent image representation. Tangent images are the mnemonic projection of a spherical image onto square, oriented pixel grids set tangent to the sphere at the center of each icosahedral face. So there's a lot packed into that description. Let's break it down a bit. First, a mnemonic projection is simply the projection of a sphere onto a tangent plane. For tangent images, we determine the placement of these tangent planes according to each face of a subdivided icosahedron. Now, a key concept is that these tangent planes are all oriented according to a fixed coordinate system. So this allows us to associate them with the orientation of a spherical image. So now we have a collection of square planes. We can tessellate these square planes with squares and turn them into pixel grids. To create tangent images, we render the spherical image onto these pixel grids. So in this image, I only show a select few tangent images, uh, but here now we have a clip visualization of the complete tangent image representation. And here you can actually see tangent images in ac action representing a sphere. So let's talk for a minute about how we generate tangent images. These next few slides are going to introduce some useful nomenclature for the process. Our first step is to set a base level of subdivision B. This is how many times we want to subdivide the icosahedron. For example, if we set B equals to 1, we're going to derive ta our tangent images from a level 1 subdivided icosahedron. Now, once we set this base level, we will have determined three things. First, the number of tangent images, which is equal to the number of faces of our base level icosahedron. Next, the distortion characteristic of the tangent image. This is an example here on the screen of a base level one tangent image. Notice the low distortion characteristics as demonstrated by the Tissot's indicatrices that I've superimposed on it. Additionally, for perspective, the associated icosahedral face is also projected in yellow. And so you can see how the tangent image overlaps the face. Now, the final attribute that the base level determines is the field of view of the tangent image. A base level one tangent Im image results in a 51 degree field of view. So I want to pause here for a second and highlight a useful observation. Uh, I'll be honest that my choice of B equals one for this example was not really arbitrary. It turns out that base level one is the best base level for most of the applications we experiment on. So why might that be? Well, recall that tangent images are formed via the mnemonic projection. 
This is a synonymous term for a rectilinear or perspective projection, which is what we also use to form central perspective images. Now, for those of you who may have dabbled in photography, you may recall that the standard field of view for a rectilinear lens is in the range of 25 to 60 degrees, depending on the lens. So here we have an image formed via the same projection and in the same field of view range as a central perspective image. Effectively, tangent images are quite similar to central perspective images. And as we're going to see, this makes a big impact on our ability to transfer networks to spherical data. So now that we've set a base level, we also need to determine the pixel resolution of the tangent image. Let's say we have a spherical image with a resolution S, where S is going to be in terms of the equivalent icosahedral subdivision level. So for example, we can set S equals 8. Um, it's at level 8 icosahedron. Um, it is the resolution. So from this, we can then compute the dimensions of the tangent image, D. And this is by the relation D equals 2 to the S minus B. So for our level 8 input with the base 1 icosahedron, we end up with a 2 to the 7th, or 128 by 128 pixel image, or tangent image. Take note of this relationship. Just like image upsampling and downsampling, and just like subdivision, tangent images also scale up and down by a factor of four each time. So here's an example of a set of tangent images. On the left, you can see the original spherical input. And on the right, you can see a set of 20 tangent images generating using a base level of zero. Now at this juncture, I want to stop for a second and highlight two important properties of the tangent image representation. First, they're de derived from the subdivide, uh, excuse me, they're derived from the icosahedron. And then second, they're oriented pixel grid representation. So this means that our representation is going to be minimally distorted, and we don't need any fancy tools to apply our off-the-shelf computer vision algorithms to our spherical data. So, so now we've gone over how to generate tangent images, but how can we use them? Well, to use them, we simply take our spherical input, render it to a set of tangent images, apply our desired algorithm on these tangent images, and then take our tangent image outputs and render them back to our spherical representation. I want to reiterate this process for a second because it's one of the really exciting things about tangent images. All you need are two resampling operations, one to create the tangent images and one to transform the output back to the sphere. That's it. Once you have tangent images, you can apply whatever computer vision algorithm you want. So now that you know how to create and use tangent images, let's look at how they perform. Our first experiment is on the task of semantic segmentation. Our goal with this experiment is to demonstrate the high resolution capabilities of tangent images. Now, for this experiment, we're going to use the same mean IOU metric as with the map convolution experiment. And we're also going to look at mean accuracy as well. And this is simply the percentage of correct predictions. So how do we do? Well, not well, it seems. Zhang et al. performs significantly better than us, as do many of the other concurrent icosahedral methods. But wait for a second. All is not as it appears. Take a look at the input resolution. This evaluation is performed at level 5 spherical images. So here's an example of a level 5 spherical image at actual size for reference. These images have the angular resolution like that of a 16 by 16 perspective image. That's half of a thumbnail image. Now, tangent images are breaking that already low angular resolution image into a low pixel resolution image. So in other words, at low spherical resolutions, tangent images are taking images with little content and breaking them up into smaller images with even less content per image. But look what happens when we instead evaluate on a high resolution spherical image we get a 10.5% improvement in accuracy and 8.5% improvement over, in mean IOU over the top level five results. Now remember, no other method has been capable of operating at this level of spherical resolution. For perspective, here are the actual sizes of the images we train on. This is a 4K echorectangular image. And here is an exemplar 512 by 512 tangent image at base level one. Now, unlike at level five, we can clearly see that the occupant of this office has a misfortune to be a New York Jets fan. So here you can clearly see the stark difference in the level of detail available to our network when we train on level 10 inputs. This level 10 input is 32 times larger 
than the level five input. The benefits of high resolution training become, become abundantly clear when we look at some qualitative outcomes. Now the top row of images here show an example input to our network uh, and its associated ground truth. The bottom row shows our network predictions when that input is provided at level five, level seven, and level 10. I wanna draw your attention to the chairs in our level 10 predictions. Look at the accuracy and fine granularity of our segmentation. Now compare this to level seven, which is much more pixelated, and level five, where it's not even entirely clear what those purple blobs represent. So these results are indicative of the accuracy benefits that we get when we process high resolution spherical images. Now my second experiment for tangent images aims to evaluate their ability to facilitate network transferability. For this, I train a network on central perspective images and then evaluate it on spherical data. Our goal here is to preserve the performance between the two representations. So if our network achieves 60% accuracy on central perspective images, we want it to also achieve 60% accuracy on spherical inputs. Now in theory, the extra field of view of a spherical image should provide additional content and context for our network. So Ideally, we would actually think we could see improved performance when we apply our network to spherical images. So I evaluate network transfer using the same semantic segmentation task. I use the same two metrics as before, mean accuracy and mean IOU, but note that I've also added two more. These are the percentage of network performance preserved through transfer. For example, if performance is equivalent on both perspective and spherical data, this number would be 100%. Now, if the transferred spherical performance is better than the perspective performance, this number is going to be above 100%. So if it's above 100, it means it's that much better than the perspective performance. So here are our results. Right off the bat, simply using the tangent image representation allows us to preserve about 96% of network performance. So what does this mean? Well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of prior work that's done this type of experiment. One does provide quantitative results on a different data set that we can use to judge our performance. In their results, they appear to do equivalently well. About 96% of performance is preserved. But keep in mind that these results are after, about, after 10 epochs of fine tuning. This means that they trained their network on spherical data for a full 10 iterations through the data set. Well, we get the same transferability without any additional training. This begs the question then, what can we achieve if we fine tune as well? Well, so after just a single epoch of fine tuning on spherical data, we achieve effective parity and performance between spherical inputs and perspective inputs. Now after 10 epochs, we actually see, there we go, uh, after 10 epochs, we have to actually see a 4% improvement when transferring to spherical images compared to central perspective images alone. This is huge. It means that the tangent image representation has sufficiently mitigated distortion to start tapping into those hypothesized wide field of view benefits. Now, a final thing to note is that the preservation percentages given for Zhang et al. are computed by comparing the fine-tuned network to the original network without fine-tuning. Conversely, we fine-tune the perspective network for additional epics as well in order to control for the extra training. So we calculate our pre uh, preservation percentages by comparing to network transfer at equivalent levels of fine tuning. If we report our results in the same way as Zhang et al, we would actually see an 8% boost in our IOU. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna spend as much time on this final experiment. However, it's just as important because it demonstrates that tangent images have applications beyond just deep learning. Because we've changed the image representation rather than the tools of convolution, we can apply the low distortion benefits to traditional computer vision tasks as well. Let's look at sparse key point detection, for example. This is a fundamental problem of traditional 3D computer vision. The goal is to identify and describe points in a scene that can be detected and equivalently described from another view in the scene. The primary modern purpose is to solve the image correspondence problem. That is to match scene points between sets of images in order to estimate certain geometric properties of a camera or a scene. Common uses include estimating intrinsic camera parameters like focal lengths from images or structure for motion, which uh, seeks to reconstruct a 3D uh, model of a scene from a collection of 2D images. 
and there are many others as well. Spherical distortion affects the detection and computation of these feature points in the same way it does for convolution. And this results in spurious points in distorted region, like you see on the floor and the ceiling here. Now, this noise impacts the downstream tasks, making it harder and or slower to properly find image correspondences. Now, if we use tangent images instead of equirectangular uh, images, this leads to many fewer noisy points, which we found creates a sizable improvement in the subsequent correspondence matching problem. So you can see how with tangent images, we see points much more cleanly detected on the floor and the ceiling, adhering to lines, edges, and corners, as we would expect. Now, these results reiterate the widespread benefit of tangent images. By providing a low distortion spherical representation in the form of a standard pixel grid, we're able to impact 360 computer vision beyond just deep learning. So before we wrap up, let's look at the takeaways from tangent images. First, let's look at our three guidelines. Tangent images sufficiently address distortion because they're derived from the icosahedron. And they scale and transfer efficiently and effectively because they use a pixel grid representation. So the big reason tangent images achieve both scalability and transferability is because we design them around current optimizations. 2D convolution has become so ubiquitous that it's being physically embedded in chips. We shouldn't fight this progress. Instead, let's find a way to make it work for the problems we want to solve. Additionally, I've shown that once we get the distortion issue out of the way, we're actually able to tap into improved performance with the ultra wide field of view that 360 provides. And finally, tangent images are a promising general solution to the spherical image problem. They're actually the first contribution in this area of the field that can be leveraged for both new advances in deep learning and improvements for traditional vision problems as well. So I want you to take a few big picture ideas away from my talk today. First, there are many opportunities for 360 computer vision, whether it's immersive and virtual experiences, medical imaging, robotics, autonomous driving, really anything you could think of that could use eyes in the back of its head. However, to enable these applications, spherical distortion must first be mitigated. Distortion destroys the translational equivariance required for the proper functionality of convolutional neural networks. And because spherical distortion is a function of our choice of representation, the image representation is going to matter a lot. A good choice is going to be the subdivided icosahedron or some derivation thereof. Now, if you want to truly unlock the potential of 360 computer vision, scalability and transferability are paramount in our approach. The key to achieving these properties for convolutional neural networks is to try to avoid any modification to the kernel operation. Instead, tangent images provide a promising solution that satisfy all necessary properties of a general solution to the spherical image problem. However, tangent images are the beginning and not the end of a general solution. There are still areas to improve upon and understand further. For example, while clearly useful, tangent images are not identical to using the full 360 field of view. They're disjoint, and it would be great to avoid this disjointedness if possible. And I suspect that resolving this would lead to even better network performance. And also, while we know too much distortion is problematic, it's not entirely clear where it becomes a problem. And the impact of distortion on neural networks is actually quite understudied in large part because for central perspective images, we have existing techniques to remove it. So these limitations suggest a few interesting directions for future work. Uh, first, it's worth doing a further analysis on distortion on convolutional neural networks to better understand the limitations of these groundbreaking tools. To what extent is a network inherently robust to distortion? What degree can distortion be learned away through data augmentation strategies? And is it going to differ based on the task? And so this is something I'm actually currently studying and hope to turn into a paper this fall. Additionally, I would like to explore how else we can leverage the low distortion properties of the icosahedron beyond just deep learning. Many traditional vision tasks use, use direct pixel matching to solve the image correspondence problem. And this requires the same sort of translational equivariance as convolution. By reducing spherical distortion, I would expect to see improvements for these applications as well. 
Now, finally, can the disjointedness of tangent images be overcome in the convolution operation? So differentiable rendering has become a hot topic of late in deep learning. And I'm interested to see if this can allow us to incorporate tangent image rendering into the learning process. I suspect that this approach may resolve the disjointedness of the representation. So in conclusion today, I wanna to leave you with a few final thoughts. First, there's a lot of exciting applications of 360 imaging, so long as the tools are there to enable it. But it's not enough to simply solve the distortion problem. It needs to be a useful solution. For that, scalability and transferability are necessary attributes. And finally, I firmly believe that any general solution to the 360 image problem will be found by focusing on the image representation rather than the processing tools. And for that, I believe my contributions presented today provide a promising step forward. So here are the full citations for the papers referenced in my talk today. And here is a list of works I've authored or contributed to during my PhD. Before I take questions, I would like to first thank a few people. First, thank you to my committee for helping to guide my dissertation. I specifically want to thank my advisor, Jan Michael, for his patience, guidance, and support over these last five years. I also want to thank my direct collaborators, True, Akash, Pierre, John, Misha, and Tang. All of you have made a significant impact in my research, and I'm sincerely thankful. Additionally, the members of the Vision Labs here, I've appreciated all the conversations, the lunches, and, and our failed attempts to get scrums going over the past few years. Um, and there's so many other people in the department here at UNC without whom I would not have made it to today. I wanna to call out a few people in particular. Uh, first, Murray Andereg, who uh, effectively taught me how to use Linux and saved me countless times when I thought I may have deleted my file system or done something else stupid. Um, and Brandy Day, who has brightened so many of my days over the last few years. And, and there's so many more people. Our department really has a wonderful community. I'm, I'm gonna be really sad to move on. And lastly, I wanna thank my family for encouraging me these past five years, Cosmo for being my best friend unconditionally, and then finally, my wife, who has been a steady source of support and reinforcement through all the ups and downs of this endeavor. And now thank you all for your time today and happy belated Mother's Day to the moms out there. Are there any questions? <laughs>